Welcome to Fox News Black Report. This is The Space. We bring you Black America's headline news, views, and opinions. I'm Romeo. Hey there, I'm Brooke. I'm Demi. Peace and love. I'm Mia. All right, we have a lot coming up for you on today's show. The DOJ is suing the state of Texas. It's a familiar lawsuit. We'll break it down and why this may not be the end. Plus, a pretty shocking case where a black defendant, he's going to be tried again due to an all-white jury deliberating in a jury room with a scene just you just have to wait and see. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus, Emmett Till's federal investigation is closed with no new charges. A, spe- a suspect has been charged in the fatal shooting of Beverly Hills philanthropist Jacqueline Avant. And Negro League baseball players earn spots in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. We have all that and so much more. You know why? Because it's our voice, it's our truth. So let's get to it. Good evening, soulmates. Thanks for joining us this Tuesday. Uh, The Department of Justice has filed a lawsuit against the state of Texas. They are alleging Republican state lawmakers discriminated against black and Latino voters and have, quote, again, diluted the voting strength of minority Texans when they approved new redistricting maps. The AP reports a DOJ assessment of the new districts found they violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Attorney General Merrick Garland says at a press conference, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act holds state laws must provide voters with an equal opportunity to participate in the democratic process and elect representatives of their choosing. Associate Attorney General Vanita Gupta added, the districts were drawn with discriminatory intent. They are making it very clear, these allegations. Again, this is very similar to what happened with with the state of Georgia. They are also currently suing the state of Georgia, alleging that those uh, lawmakers, excuse me, in the state of Georgia specifically tried to disenfranchise black voters. This, again, is not the last lawsuit we are likely to see against the state making moves and doing what they have the power to do under their state laws. And the feds say, hey, actually, it's unconstitutional. Yeah, I agree. If you think about the last election, I think President Trump or former President Trump, he had 52 percent while Biden had 46 percent. The gap is closing. We saw what happened in Georgia last election. It got flipped to blue. So they want to control it. And Texas, let's be honest. This minority-driven state, when you talk mm-hmm. about black yeah. and brown and people of color, mm-hmm. they run that state when it comes to the numbers. So they're saying, how can we control the state and keep it out of their hands? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this uh, lawsuit is based around redistricting. And we know this is an old trick that the Republican Party uses to disenfranchise uh, people of color. And the key word is gerrymandering. And we know that they do it either two ways. It's either packing or cracking. And packing is when you have two major uh, districts of color and what they try to do is consolidate them, which forces a runoff. For like example, here in Los Angeles, it would be as if they took Maxine Waters district and Karen Bass's district and they pushed them together to kind of force the two of them to fight for the black votes. And then when you talk about cracking, it means when they dilute the district, meaning that they took Maxine's water uh, district and then they tried to put it in another district, maybe run by a predominantly white conservative district to where it dilutes it and then the black people lose their voting power. Um, That's why it is so great to have three branches of government. Um, If the judicial doesn't get it right, we know the Supreme Court is why all of things are happening. If the executive branch doesn't get it right, then we have, of course, the judicial system, which is the Department of Justice, to fix this problem. And last point is, thank goodness that the National Democratic um, Redistricting Committee, which was started by uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder and former President Barack Obama, they created this organization right before uh, President Obama left office because they knew that this would happen and they knew that we would have to be able to counteract what the uh, Republicans are right now successfully uh, achieving. Mm-hmm. All right, now Minneapolis Police Chief. Meridondo Eridondo announced Monday that he won't accept a third term as chief, a blow to a department that has been struggling since four officers were charged in George Floyd's death. Now, Eridondo, 54, said he would retire in January after 32 years at the department, calling it a time 
for a new chief to leave. And he said, I believe that now is the right time to allow for new leadership, new perspectives, new focus, and a new hope to lead the department forward in, collabor in collaboration with our communities. Um, you know, this, this police chief, you know, I talked to a few uh, organizers in Minneapolis and, you know, they applauded him and said that, you know, when those four officers, you know, killed George Floyd, he immediately fired them. Um, he was very proactive with making sure that accountability was held. He testified, you know, against Derek Chauvin. And they also said that when it came time to sit at the table, he always had an open door policy. But we just know the city of, city of Minneapolis, you know, they've just had so much turmoil that it probably is good after 30 years to allow new leadership to come in and have a fresh uh point of view and fresh eyes. Hmm. Well, I actually kind of disagree. Uh, you know, I don't think that it's fair to try to hold him back because if he feels deeply in his heart that it's time for him to move on, then it is just time for him to move on. But um, him being the first black police chief and, uh, you know, we were so excited when he was able to speak on George Floyd's behalf um, during the Derek Chauvin murder trial. And so I feel like there should be more of him in his position and on his team before he leaves than to just kind of leave because it feels like you know he's there and the city of minneapolis is going through so much right now that it feels like he would kind of usher in some more uh black support to kind of make sure that the, the the police department is good before he leaves so of course i don't know the exact makeup of the police department but um if he feels like it's time to go it's time to go but i just don't know if it's time for new leadership yet like i think th that there should be a successor first before he leaves Look, that's similar to him yeah and prior to him leaving there was already enough pressure on him we thought about the george mm -hmm. floyd murder right george floyd murder also with three 300 officers left the force after that. Crime went up after that. So much to take on. So I don't want to put that responsibility on his shoulder mm -hmm. for saying you can't leave until you know that we're in good hands. I mean, who knows what kind of stress he goes through when he's not at work. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of work to be done. We're also talking about a city. We're talking about a state that was talking about maybe getting rid of the police departments altogether, right? Mm -hmm. So think about that as combined all the years he had on his belt. Maybe him being on the inside saying, look, I don't see the ray of light anytime soon. or I don't know if I can do enough to help the city get back on their feet. So maybe it is time for him to do that. He's had an interesting tenure as chief. You know, obviously, on one hand, absolutely, you can say he testified against Derek Chauvin saying, listen, he didn't follow proper protocol, but this happened under him. There were four officers involved that the prosecution at least says four of them did things that were problematic. Somebody died. The initial report that came out after somebody died with an officer's knee on that man's neck was a man had a medical issue mm -hmm. and passed away, unfortunately. That wasn't the truth. All of this happened under this man's tenure. Also, you'll remember Derek Chauvin has been indicted for something that happened in 2017. And he wasn't fired after that incident happened in 2017. He was allowed to remain on the force until 2020 when he killed someone. And now, obviously, now he is a convicted murderer. But there are a lot of things that happened that many of the activists in Minneapolis say, hey, these are systemic issues and these are happening under your tenure. And this same chief, after testifying against Derek Chauvin, came out during the election and, you know, was basically laying it all out there and asking people to vote against changing up the department to vote against kind of redistributing the money he wanted to keep at least that aspect of things he wanted to keep them the same so there's a lot of pressure and it's it's kind of confusing to see even where he stands as far as what should happen in this department yeah, well, we yeah and we posted. know that typically when uh cities i know here in los angeles when they pick a police chief it really determines the uh it's determined by the police commission and the uh the mayor of the city of course the community does have a say they get to attend the meetings they get to have a say so you know if minneapolis has the same structure which most cities do then this will be an opportunity for the people and the constituents in the minneapolis area to participate and be able uh, to be a part of the process to pick their new police chief, which I think is will be helpful and hopeful for those people. Well, soulmates, we'll definitely keep you posted on that. President Joe Biden has nominated Shalanda Young as director of the Office of Management and Budget, who will take up the post if confirmed. The nomination is a big deal because Young will become the first black woman to hold the position if approved by the Senate. Since March, Young has been an active bu acting budget director, but she would now formally move into the post as the Biden administration works to apply its economic agenda, according to The Hill. 
That includes a $1.9 trillion pandemic relief package, an infrastructure plan exceeding $1 trillion. It will also consist of a $1.7 trillion social safety net and climate change package potentially being passed by Congress in upcoming weeks. Well, you know, we always talk about how Democrats and Republicans just can't seem to agree on anything. We do know several Republican senators said they would support this. Uh, so by them saying that and doing that, do we see this as an automatic win for her to get in? Mm. Uh, well, Romeo, I think that this is great that mm. we have a black woman here, uh, Shalanda Young. But it also makes me think back to what we've been talking about the last few days, Romeo, about uh, VP Kamala Harris and all of the you know women of color that have left her cabinet. It makes me wonder uh, the timing. Of course, it's been in the works for, for a while, but um, I'm just wondering if now Biden is going to have all of these black women come in because he feels like the black community is going to feel like what's going on with VP Kamala Harris. She's not doing her job. All of these you know women of color are leaving. Um, are, are Now I need to have some black women back in my cabinet to kind of make us feel like he's here for us. So I don't know. I, I'm happy. But I'm also I, I feared that, um, you know, all, there was going to be an influx of like, you know, women of color back into the Biden uh, Harris administration to kind of make it feel soft serve us to make it feel like, hey, we're still here for you. Even though they're leaving, we still want to make sure that, that we have black people around us. So I don't know. I could be making that up. But that's just kind of how I feel when I read this. Okay. Well, she's been doing the job sure. since the first nominee mm -hmm. didn't make it. Um, I believe she withdrew. So she's actually been doing the job for months. So she's definitely qualified for it. But it's really in the hands of the Senate. We know that the Senate has to approve her. So we'll just see what the Republicans do. Or if it's a 50-50 split, that's when VP Kamala Harris will come in and have to make the decision. So time mm -hmm. will tell. Fox Atlanta's Claire Sims recently had a one on one interview with Democrat Stacey Abrams, who announced last week that she will run for governor again next year. Take a look. Former House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams says she will run for governor in 2022, a potential rematch of her 2018 race against current governor Brian Kemp. Because I think Georgia has amazing opportunities ahead but we need real leadership to get there. Leadership that actually plans to invest in all of Georgia and all Georgians. And that is not the leadership we have in the governor's mansion right now. We sat down with Abrams one-on-one -on -one to talk about the current issues facing the state, including the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Abrams says she would implement a more aggressive vaccination program and allow local communities to build the responses they need. Rather than picking fights with mayors, which is what the governor has spent the last two years doing, instead of picking fights, he needs to be picking his better battles. And that means working with local communities to understand their needs, to understand their hesitation, to understand their access, and actually investing. That's the work I've done, not while I'm in office, but as a private citizen. I've worked to expand access to vaccines. I've traveled to South Georgia to make sure people got shot in arms, but also information in their hands. Abrams says expanding Medicaid would also help, driving down medical costs and creating new jobs, especially in rural parts of the state where hospitals have closed. Jobs don't come to places where you can't find doctors. We have to make certain that rural Georgia and all of Georgia has the full bevy of opportunities, and that means Medicaid expansion. As soon as Abrams announced her entrance into the race, Kemp and others condemned her candidacy. Some top state leaders have criticized you for um, essentially calling this a stepping stone or a platform for you to try to run for the presidency. What's your response to that? If I am elected governor, my intention is to serve as governor of Georgia for four years. What I'm dis disappointed in is this idea that having ambition for more is something we should be looking down on this day. I want us to be ambitious about our children's future. I want us to be ambitious about how we can be not only the number one state for business, but the number one state for families. So it's so interesting when uh, we were watching that the first thing that I said before the reporter asked, I was like, oh, my gosh, she just is so inspiring that she gives me president energy like she gives me president, vice president en uh, energy. And so when the reporter asked, I was like, OK, cool. So I'm not the only one that feels um, like she is inspiring. Uh, I know that she wants to, you know, be in Georgia. F but I mean, here in California, you know, the people in Illinois all across the world, we know Stacey Abrams, her name and what she has done for Georgia, but also for the world. 
honestly so motivating and I honestly would kind of love to see her in the presidency as well like she just gives me that presidential energy like I love that well first of all she seems like she wants to take her home first and mm -hmm. we love that right but she's just like think don't about get ahead don't right. whoa, she's whoa, like, whoa. let me take her in my own backyard <laughs> then maybe I can take her to the rest of the country but I love the fact with her energy and everything about it we saw what she did for the last election how mm -hmm. she spoke and how what the moves she made and what it did and what it did for the state of Georgia. So this is a very exciting for that state and possibly for the rest of the country down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we know Republican, we know Republicans are nervous because uh, Purdue just jumped into the governor's race to to battle it out with Kemp. So we have to see who is going to be running against Stacey Abrams now, because, you know, during the primaries, we're going to have to see um, who's going to be the candidate for the Republican Party. So um, Stacey Abrams has really put a match into this uh, running for uh, the governor of Atlanta. I mean, uh, the governor of Georgia. So it's going to be really interesting to watch. Um, and speaking of another powerful black woman, Vice President Kamala Harris officially marked the White House's first ever maternal health day of action. And that happened today as she hosted a summit with lawmakers, cabinet secretaries and celebrities, a White House official said. Take a look. And think about it, regardless of income level, regardless of education level, black women, native women, women who live in rural areas, are more likely to die or be left scared or scarred from an experience that should be safe and should be a joyful one. And we know a primary reason why this is true, systemic inequities. Mm. Now, Harris issued the nationwide call to action to the private and public sectors and announced a series of federal reports and guidance, among other things, aimed at improving maternal health in the United States, according to CNN. Now, the VP also pointed to her work on the issue for, from her career as a district attorney in California to now, including introducing the Maternal Act, uh, Care Act and the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act while in the city. In it. Harris recited a series of statistics, particularly regarding black and Native American women in the United States. Uh, you know, we know that uh, Lauren Underwood is really pushing this bill uh, in the House. We know that it passed in California and we know on the Senate level, Cory Booker is also supporting this bill. But I also think this is showing Kamala Harris with all of the headlines, with the turmoil in her communications department. She's trying to turn that curve. Yesterday, she met with a dozen of black women civil rights leaders about voting rights and the uh, Build Back America plan. I mean, Melanie Campbell was in the room, Glenda Carr, uh, Bishop Leah Daltrey, and so many other black women were at the White House yesterday. So I believe that she understands the narrative that has been in the headlines for her a couple of days. And she's like, look, I'm about to turn it up and I'm about to show you what it means when Kamala Harris is vice president. Absolutely. You know, Nia, we were literally just talking about this days ago about uh, VP Kamala Harris needing more talking points, needing to be more out there, like you were just saying. And so this was very, very timely. And um, also at the White House was a uh, track star Allison Felix. And so a lot of people were uh, so excited to meet her. And, you know, she's had her own uh, battles with being a mother and being a track star. And so I like also to making, um, you know, it was great to have the, the, the political um, power powerhouses like you mentioned, Neil, but also more of a, a, you know, someone that you can just touch and you can feel relatable having Allison Felix be there as well and represent and talk about motherhood and how important it is. Uh, being a mother in the limelight, too, was very, very powerful. And um, this is great. I think uh, VP Kamala Harris is doing the right thing, keeping the ball rolling. And hopefully we see more because that's what we've been needing in the last few weeks is because we haven't heard anything from her as, at all. It's kind of kind of scary in a way. You know, this shines a light on how important health care equity is as opposed to health care equality, specifically when it comes to black women, black women. And, and, she, and the VP did talk specifically about the disproportionate rate. But I want to use the numbers. Black women are four times as likely to experience childbirth, pregnancy related death than their white counterparts. Four times as likely to go through nine months thinking that you're going to have a baby and die and your family have to deal with that. And many of these things, because of systemic racism, are things that can be fixed. And we do know that it's not simply a class issue, that it doesn't end there. It is a racism issue because everybody needs health care. That's equality, right? Everybody needs health care. And, and that's a fight that many are, are having and fighting right now. But once everybody gets health care, 
It's as simple as what if your doctor doesn't believe you? What if your doctor believes a long held myth that you feel pain differently or that people who look like you like to lie? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we saw what happened with Serena Williams where she talks about having a white ally, her, her, her advocate, her husband in that room helped save her life because he is somebody who would be listened to. Right. And he talks about the importance of that and how unfair that is and how awful that is. And so this is an important topic that we need to continue to talk about because babies deserve to be with their whole families, period. Yes, yes true. Yeah. All right, the U.S. announced Monday it will not send officials to the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics in protest of human rights abuses committed by the Chinese Communist Party. CNN reporting this diplomatic boycott won't prevent American athletes, by the way, of competing. It does mark, though, a major escalation between the U.S. and China amid already heightened tensions over the CCP's treatment of Muslim minorities, military threats to Taiwan and economic tariffs. And so very specifically talking about the treatment of Uyghur Muslims in China, what's also interesting is that every time Americans make this point, China comes back and says, look at how you treat black people. Mm. How dare you? It's a pot calling the kettle black and it's just a big global embarrassment on all ends. But, you know, it, it's good to start somewhere. Yeah, you know, many are saying, hey, listen, what's happening to these people is atrocious. I, I, and again, many people coming back and saying, <laughs> uh, OK, the call is coming from inside the house. Mm. But, um, you know, they're not this is not the only country doing that. And it is interesting to say, hey, we want to support the athletes at the same time. We have to take some sort of a stand. And then also we're two superpowers who somehow have to work together to when it comes to climate change, when it comes to so many other aspects of this world surviving. And it's an interesting space to be in. It definitely is. And with the 22, what is it, 2022 Winter Olympics uh -huh. coming up, mm -hmm. will, will it affect that? Because it's still a business. They still want to make their money. So we don't know if this will carry over, if tensions will get higher before then, and it may not happen altogether. We have to wait and see what happens with that. Brooke, I'm with you. I kind of giggled when I read this story um, because it's like how how people of color are treated in this country. I know the world giggled and chuckled as well. But we just did a couple of stories about um, Aaron Jackson, who is breaking records in, in speed skating, and she is uh, going to the Winter Olympics. And so I, you know, am just, you know, thinking about the o uh, Olympic, the Olympians that from the United States that are preparing for the Winter Olympics. And I hope that this doesn't put a shadow over all the hard work that they are doing and have done to come to this moment in 2022. All right, soulmates, coming up, we talk about the rise of white supremacy in this country. We have some stories that will rattle you. Those are all coming up next on Fox Soul's Black Report.